Baku, breath to spark the human heart. Hello there, family and friends. This is episode two of the Baku podcast. Um, I'm Mark. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. If uh, this is your first time listening to Baku, welcome. If, uh, if perhaps you listened to the first one and you've come back, well, it's surprising, but thank you very much for, for tuning back in just to see what, um, what I'm talking about this week. I also want to just stop for a moment and um, again say thank you to my family and friends who have sent me some messages this week, uh, who have called and had a bit of a chat about the first episode. I really do appreciate it. It's been helpful for me to receive some of those words of encouragement to, um, to spur me on to, to go again this week. And I did commit to a weekly podcast. Um, so here I am doing it again. But what I've found really interesting about some of the messages that I've received from friends is um, just hearing the way that some of the ideas and experiences that I shared last week <clears throat> have resonated with different people. Uh, and often people who perhaps I may not have known these experiences would connect with. And that's... Um, that's really a big part of my intention behind this podcast is I believe there's something very powerful in sharing our stories, in, in making ourselves a little bit vulnerable, because that's where we start to discover some new connections and some resonance in our experience. And by doing so, we actually start to help each other to feel more connected with ourselves and with each other as friends, as communities, and as a whole, as, as part of that, the human experience in all its mystery and, and depth and messiness. So thank you. Thanks so much for your thoughts, your encouragement, and your feedback. I, I really appreciate it. So here we are at episode two of the Baku podcast. And week one was exciting. I had a lot of energy leading into it. I worked on what I wanted to say and I was still fiddling with bits and pieces of the technical side, which was a, a nice little distraction. And after I released it, it was like there was a big dump of adrenaline. And I had this sinking feeling. Which, um, which is not unusual when you start something new. It happens on a macro and a micro level to us all the time in our, in our experience. But as I sat thinking about my commitment that I've made to release a podcast a week, I started to feel this resistance. And I'm not talking about a little French army inside me. I'm talking about... The resistance described by Stephen Pressfield in his book, The War of Art. If you're an artist or a writer or a painter or a speaker and, and you uh, can identify with that feeling of resistance, then Pressfield's work's actually really interesting and I, I'd recommend you do check it out. The way Pressfield describes it is that resistance is this force that stands between us and our creative work. It's that voice of doubt and anxiety that starts to creep in and begins questioning our best intentions. It's by no means a new concept in the ancient Hebrew texts. Resistance was called the Hesatan, or translated to English, the adversary or the accuser. But in Pressfield's work, he defines resistance as the weapon of the ego which resides in our logical brain. Powerful powerful and scary you think what's the purpose of this thing you know i want to get on and, and do something and hopefully create something that speaks to some people and we've got this inbuilt resistance that that starts nibbling away <laughs> our best intentions and creating all that fear and doubt so the ego the ego is great at imagining what other people will think if we begin to reveal our true selves through some form of creative expression. And we're not born with this ego. 
And I can clearly remember as a, a about three or four years old being at my grandparents' house there in, um, in Glen Waverley in the back room, in the living room. They had a little coffee table and my grandfather would often pop on records and I was more than happy at the age of three and four to spin on my back on the coffee table doing my best impression of what I thought rap dancing would look like. My song of choice, La Bamba by Los, Los Lobos. But over time, the dances became less frequent. And now when we think about people spinning on their backs on coffee tables, we don't really expect to see people doing that unless it's part of an intoxicated escapade of some description. So we're born egoless. And over the years, conditioning starts to creep in and we learn what's expected of us. The ego teaches us to value the approval and recognition of others because that's what would have been important to fit in with a tribe in our earlier iterations of human, human life. But the ego teaches us to value approval and recognition over and above more important values of truth and love. So what does this resistance feel like? What does it feel like when we're under siege from the weapons of the ego? Well, to me this week, it felt like concrete in my stomach weighing me down. And then at other times, it felt like helium in my head lifting me up. Like I was either too heavy or I was losing my sense of groundedness. What does the resistance sound like? Well, the resistance is the realm of our limiting beliefs. The social programming in our subconscious brain through either caution of well-meaning people around us or our own personal experiences that becomes responsible for our internal struggles every time we try to step outside of the box. Resistance is there trying to push us back in. It's the yeah buts, the you shoulds, the you shouldn'ts, the you aren't enoughs, the you don't know enoughs, you're not prepared enoughs, that pop into our heads when we start out on any new endeavour. And this week I heard it loud and clear. In Pressfield's work, he describes the tussle and the struggle between the ego and the deeper self. The self, Pressfield describes as the unconscious mind, sitting way deeper beneath the, our subconscious mind in a place of unchangeable truth. So this can all get a bit murky when we start exploring the different parts of our mind the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. And there are a lot of different words and ideas floating around that attempt to describe the experience of the mind. But they are just that. They're just words. They're theoretical or metaphorical. We think about the fields that are interested in the mind. Psychology, theology. Ology simply means to think about, to think about the mind, to think about God. The mind unlike a chair or even the brain, is not something that we can touch. It's not something we can hold or cut open and analyse. We can only learn about the mind through observation and experience, and we allude to these observations and experiences with words like the ego, resistance, the self, the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. So with all this dancing around, with words you may be wondering why anybody would choose to explore this subject. It'd be far easier for you, Mark, if you chose to do a podcast on classic cars or Datsuns or coffee or something, some other interest. And right now that seems like a pretty good idea, to be honest. But at the risk of sounding like a fool, here I am sitting in my living room all by myself with my dog sprawled out on the couch on my own little venture, stepping out, attempting to clarify and distill some meaningful insights from the wisdom of other people that I've gathered up over the years and out of the mess of my own personal experience. Now, resistance 
has its place both in standing between us and our work. But as I stopped to think about it, I realized resistance has a place in all human experience. And during the first round of stage three restrictions, half of Australia suddenly became exercise fanatics. Rebel, all the other major sporting stores were sold out of home fitness equipment. And I joined, I joined this movement with a renewed focus on a classic activity brought to us courtesy of the 1960s, namely jogging. When jogging originally came to the attention of the mainstream in the US, the activity often aroused suspicion. Joggers were regularly stopped by police and the general consensus in the community was that the sight of a grown man running was quite foolish and undignified. So in the first round of lockdowns, the risk of being stopped by the police was fairly low. However, that's probably on the rise again at the moment. But I seized the opportunity to build a little bit of cardio and to have a regular legitimate reason to be leaving the house. Now, up until about 18 months ago, I've completely neglected any sort of endurance training for a very long time. And when I say a very long time, I really mean sort of since birth. I'd just always been drawn to stop start sports like tennis, skateboarding and surfing, where you can just take breaks, you know, regular breaks between short bursts of moderate to vigorous activity. But having done a lot of years of these sports, in my naivety, I sort of still believed that setting out on a five kilometer run was something that I could just do. And I'd been, made, I'd been known to make this claim amongst friends and family. Yeah, I could run to Point Danger and back easy. I just don't have the right shoes. And it may surprise you to learn that the first time I stepped out the door to go for a jog, strapped on the new running shoes, the sun rising over the sand dunes in front of me, the cool morning air sweet nectar to my lungs as I strode steadily down the road. And it was all going great, right up until I reached the end of the street, where my thoughts quickly turned from, this feels pretty good, to I'm dying. I can't breathe. My legs hurt. Why am I doing this? Why would anybody do this? The echoes of the wisdom of the 1960s ring in my ears. This is foolish and undignified for a grown man and you should really just go home. And this may sound familiar if you've ever taken up jogging or any other steady state cardio. You'll know what I'm talking about. My body went from feeling like a well-oiled machine to a heavy sack of potatoes in the space of a couple of strides. That first experience often starts out feeling great, right up until the resistance starts to kick in. Now fortunately for me, I have some great people around me who are able to provide some sage advice about overcoming some of these early difficulties in my jogging career. Two people in particular, Matt and Maddie, two coaches at the Bones MMA gym, which actually sparked my interest in running in the first place. The more I trained there, the more I learned about fighting, the more I realized how completely inept I am in the art of fighting, and if I was ever involved in a real fight, I'd be in real trouble. So I figured I'd better learn to run fast and far. And as I discussed my new jogging venture with Matt and Matt, I learned two things which have been really helpful. Number one is you break the jog down into segments of running and walking. You gradually increase the time spent running and reduce the number of walks so that eventually, over seven or eight weeks, you're able to run at a slow pace for around 25 minutes, semi-comfortably. Learning number two is that it's completely normal to feel breathless 
and to hit that resistance at some point during the run. That's just your first wind, and it's accompanied by a sizable adrenaline dump. But once you identify that this is just your first wind, you know that you can recover and that you will be able to go on for much, much further. And with just these two pieces of advice, these two new learnings, running gradually became easier, particularly once I was able to name the resistance as just the first wind. And I began to realise that it's completely normal. And over time, this led to some slow, steady improvements. Now, right now, I'm by no means a runner. But most importantly, I've started to learn how to push through resistance when things become difficult. And perhaps even more importantly than that, if I was ever faced with a real fight, I could now run away. So this week, as I stared at the vacant page, as I wrestled with the feelings and the thoughts of the resistance, I set about coming up with some strategies that I could use each time I was faced with this similar challenge. Because I've made a commitment to create something out of nothing each week. And I'm betting that over time, the severity and the frequency of the resistance will diminish. But there will be other challenges and other new activities where again, I'll need to learn to break through that resistance. So here's five little steps that I've come up with that have helped me this week to create something out of nothing and that hopefully you'll be able to use too, whether it's to motivate yourself in your work, your study, or perhaps a new creative pursuit that you've had time to pursue now that you're stuck at home far more frequently than you used to be. And the acronym I've come up with for these five steps is SPARK. To sit, perspective, activity, reflect, and to kick off. Spark. So step one, sit with the resistance. Acknowledge the emotions, name them, and just let them flow. If naming the emotions can be tricky, which I know it can be, here's a couple of helpful questions that make this even easier. The first question, I've been using these with Jed quite a lot too over the last couple of weeks. First question is, what colour am I feeling? And just say the first colour that comes into your head. Where is the colour in my body? Does it have a shape? Is it heavy or light? Does it have a sound? Does it have a temperature? Is it hot or cold? And that's it. You've identified how you're feeling. It's been working magic with Jed actually over the last couple of couple of weeks. Every time he starts to get a bit off balance, a bit off centre, we go through our list of questions and you can see the emotion dissipate as he sits with the feelings and articulates how he's feeling in a way that's accessible to him as a four-year-old. Now the magic here is that if you can sit with the feeling, focusing on the metaphorical shape size, temperature, sound, it tends to dissipate quite quickly. And according to the Harvard brain scientist, Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, emotions tend to dissipate in about 90 seconds if they can be labeled and observed. The reason emotions don't dissipate in that 90 seconds is that if we don't find a suitable way to distract the thinking part of our brain, the resistance kicks in and it perpetuates the self-talk that led to the feeling in the first place. So if you find yourself getting stuck in emotions, if you get getting stuck in the resistance, start by labeling them and sitting with them.
So that's step one, sit. Step two is perspective. According to Ellen J. Langer, the professor of psychology at Harvard University and author of a neat little book called Mindfulness, she says, out of an intuitive experience of the world comes a continuous flow of novel distinctions. The key to transcending the trappings of the ego or the thinking mind, which is very fond of familiar categories and concrete definitions, is to deliberately look at the world with a childlike curiosity. Adopt the disposition of playfulness. Introduce a little uncertainty into your worldview. And a really simple way that Langer suggests to do this is just start to look at the world with a bit of a, well, it could be. Well, it could be a pen. It could be a piano. It could be a drain pipe. Or it could be a tunnel to a parallel universe. And that's step two, perspective. Step three. Step three is activity. Get out and move your body. Whether you walk, run, dance, do some push-ups, whatever it is. Just get moving. My cousin Michael, he's a musician, and he swears by a long walk if you're struggling to come up with lyrics for a new song. And oddly, I've also just observed in my own experience that if I'm talking on the phone, I find it really helpful just to, just to walk around. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe it's got something to do with giving your mind an additional task. A simple task like walking that allows us to slip into a more intuitive state. So that's step three, is activity. Step four is to reflect. Reflect on a time where you felt gratitude. I've had a couple of conversations about this with a, a mate of mine who actually reflected to me that after months of dedicated gratitude practice, you know, the standard, what are three things you're grateful for each day? He actually didn't observe any discernible change in the way he was thinking or viewing the world. So either he's already in a state of complete bliss and appreciation, or the technique just wasn't quite working. And I think there's a reason this doesn't quite work is because often the way we practice gratitude in the way that we've been taught, just name three things today that we're grateful for, it actually allows us to do it quite mindlessly. Oh yeah, I'm grateful for Lego, food and the dog, which really doesn't affect our emotional state at all. But recently I picked up on a Tony Robbins gratitude exercise that utilizes the power of visualization and a more mindful meditative state to absolutely supercharge your gratitude practice. And I'll share it with you at the end of this podcast. Because again, when you're stuck and you're facing resistance, if you can access the feelings of the times where you felt absolute joy and gratitude in your life by remembering a wedding, remembering what it felt like, what you saw there, what you heard there, and you can step into those feelings, that is a powerful experience that over time will begin to shift the way that you feel about the world. So that's step four, is to reflect with gratitude. And step five, K, okay, is to kick off. Just sit down and kick off. Make a mark on the page. And it's not necessarily a mark that you'll keep or that you'll go back to, but words on the page are really, really cheap. And you can afford to throw some away. So the way I started for this podcast, as I started to move out of my stuck state, was actually to create a little poem that I'll share with you now, just to demonstrate how it doesn't need to be anything special. So here's the poem. An over-tendency to overthink. Dull responses to the moment I might lose my grip. On reality that flashes before my eyes, seesaw between the visible and blind, craving an invincible state of mind, built the ego, but it never could find. A simplicity and pleasure in the daily, always seeking pleasure by narrowly evading, the rocky waters of turbulence creating. And that's it. 
that was the beginning of coming unstuck, of finding a topic, and ultimately that has led to the recording of this podcast. So if you are finding yourself stuck, try the Spark five-step process to move through your resistance. Sit, find a new perspective, get active, reflect, and then kick off. And something else that's come to my attention this week that I'll be doing this week each day and just observing the changes, like the gratitude, um, three things that we're grateful for each day. Sometimes these things need to be tested, so I'm going to test this this week. But something that's caught my attention are the benefits of expressive writing. Now, apparently this fellow, Dr. Penn Baker, who's a centennial professor of liberal arts and professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. Now, his research about writing and the benefits of expressive writing has discovered that those who practice this technique may benefit from stronger immune health, better sleep habits, improved mental health, regulated blood pressure, and reduction in pain caused by chronic diseases. The beauty of this is his instructions for expressive writing are really, really simple too. He says just set aside 15 minutes a day for three or four consecutive days each week and use the time to write about an issue that's causing anxiety or pain. That's it, 15 minutes a day, three or four consecutive days each week just to write about an issue that's causing anxiety or pain. Just let the pen run on the page and whatever comes out, comes out. Better sleep, improved mental health, stronger immune health, regulated blood pressure, and a reduction in pain caused by chronic disease. Sounds pretty good to me. And the big kicker for me will be, if I start sleeping a whole lot better after, a, well, he says about a month of doing this, then we'll know there's something in it. So if you'd like to jump in and do that with me, um, I'd be keen to hear what your experience is like. So that's actually it for me this week. So while resistance is a really uncomfortable place to be, while it can feel really distressing, on the other side of that resistance is creativity and flow and joy. So I encourage you, wherever you are sitting at the moment, whatever you are working on, push through it. And I look forward to seeing what you'll create next. Have a great week and I'll speak to you again next week.